All right. Well, let's get on with the lesson. Two men were sitting in a business meeting one day or at luncheon, sitting there in a public restaurant, enjoying the lunch, enjoying the conversation, when all of a sudden the lady walks up. She begins to talk to one of the, the men that was sitting there. And as she talks to him, she talks to him with great familiarity. She asked about his wife. She asked about his sons. She asked about uh, things that were going on with him and things that were going on in his life. And uh, he was answering them and being quite cordial to her. And she walked off. And he looked at the other man sitting across the table from him. And he said, I deeply apologize. He said, I would have introduced you to her, except I have no idea who she was. That's a true story, because that was when I was working in Waverly, and that was the preacher that they was talking to, and I was the associate preacher. But you know, at the same point in time, too, you wonder sometimes. We read the story in the Bible of Jesus, and we wonder, why is it, how is it, that the folks of Jesus' day did not recognize Jesus? They saw him. But they didn't recognize him as the Son of God. They didn't recognize him as the prophet. They didn't recognize him as who he was. They saw him as a foreigner, a blasphemer. They saw him as an individual that was trying to destroy their faith, their religion. They saw him as an individual that was impeding upon what they believed and their progress as far as their practice of their religion. And you wonder, I do, sitting back and just saying, why didn't these people who knew the prophecies with regards to Jesus, and remember, really, the prophecies with regards to Jesus started back in the Garden of Eden. We've talked about that before, where where God says to Satan that that there's coming one, you shall bruise his head, or you shall bruise his heel, and he shall bruise your head. And we look at that, and we we move further. And in Deuteronomy, the tenth chapter, there there's the the prophecy with regards to there's going to come a prophet, and look for him. And we look at that, and we we get to the New Testament, and we say. Why don't they recognize him? Why don't they see that the, the Messiah is the one they crucified? Why didn't they? Well, you could say, well, ultimately it was the plan of God, it was the way of God. But still, these were people making decisions. And I think, at least in some way, at least for me, the answer may be found in Romans, uh, in John chapter 8, excuse me, John chapter 8. Beginning in verse 37, you have to go all the way back to about verse 15 of John chapter 8. And one of the things you find is the Pharisees attack Jesus. Well, that's not new. But the Pharisees attack Jesus under the premise of saying, you testify of yourself and your testimony is not true. In other words, put it plain and simple, in vocabulary of today, Jesus, you are a liar. You are lying about who you are. You're not telling the truth. We know you're not the Messiah. We know you're not the one to come. But the Pharisees, as was typical of the Pharisee of that day, elevate themselves in their thinking. And Jesus begins, he begins really at that point, but I want us to key on beginning in verse 37. Because it is there that he begins to, he, Jesus, begins to key on the idea of Abraham, which would resonate highly with the Jews of that day. And he says, look, if you were of Abraham's seed, if you were Abraham's lineage, truly you would understand who I am. And so there are some, some reasons, I think, Jesus gives in this text, and we're going to see them in just a second, that say this is the reason you, didn't, you saw Jesus, but you didn't recognize him. Well, what were they? Well, the first one's found in verse 37. Jesus makes a statement. He says, I know that you're Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. They did not believe the word of God. You might say, do what? That's a strong thought to say that the Jewish folks of that day and age who believed in the law, followed the law, stringently followed the law. Pharisee, you, you, you stringently followed the law. 
that they really didn't believe in the word of God. But think about what it says. Think about what Jesus charged them. Look at the very last part, part, part of that verse. My word has no place in you. The words no place, the Greek there means this. My word did not make headway into you. It didn't make headway into your heart. You might say, is that possible? Sure. I used recently the illustration of Khrushchev. Khrushchev, as a child, went to Bible school. A, uh, it wasn't what we would call Church of Christ, but he went to, to, to a Orthodox church. And part of their studies were memorizing scriptures. And Khrushchev memorized many scriptures as a youth. But we know his history. We're not getting into it. He knew the word of God, but it had no place in him. That's what Jesus is saying to these folks. It's sort of like, if you will, go outside and put a rock, say a pretty good sized rock, and put it out in the middle of your yard. And the next time it rains, go out there. One of the things that you'll notice is that that rock gets wet, but the wetness does not penetrate the rock. That word of God, Jesus told the Jews, the Pharisees, to whom he was talking, this word of God got you wet, but that's all it did. It didn't penetrate your heart. It didn't get into your heart. It didn't get into you. It, it stayed there, right there, and that's all it did. But, you know, you think about it, that's what happens to a lot of us from time to time. We sort of become like the parable of the sower, don't we? We know that there are people that are like that, and sometimes maybe even we're like that. We know the story of the sower that goes out and sows the seed in Matthew 13, and some of the seed fell by the wayside. We know that story, and we talk about how that, that seed did not penetrate the ground. That the birds came by and, and ate of the seed that fell by the wayside. Well, sometimes we read scriptures, and that's the way we read the scriptures. You might say, sometimes, yeah, because I'm convinced that in the church, at least, there are folks that read scriptures and then say, that doesn't mean me. That doesn't apply to me. It's sort of like the fella that sees the sign, no parking, yet they park there. Why do they do that? Because to them, that sign means no parking for everybody else but them. It's the idea of, I know more, I know better, I'm here. It's all right. Well, we have to ask ourselves, are we those types of people? And how do we stay away from it? Well, the question of, are we that type of individual, we have to ask ourselves. And we have to be honest with ourselves enough to, to say, I am or I am not. Hopefully, you're one that allows the Word of God to have a place in you. But how do you do that? How do you do that? Well, we have to be individuals, first of all, that are following the admonition of studying the Word of God. While 2 Timothy 2.15 in the old King James says study, the new King James says it gives diligence. Show yourself proven God. But the idea of giving diligence is the idea of study. Isaiah 34, verse 15, seek out the word of law and read it. God always intended for folks to know his word. In Acts chapter 17, verse 11, talking about those, it says, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica, talking about the Bereans. These were more noble, more virtuous, if you will, depending upon the version that you use. Fair-minded, the New King James says. These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica than that they received the word with all readiness of mind. They searched the scriptures daily whether the things were so. You see what it says to the Bereans? It says they opened up their hearts and they opened up their lives and they said, Lord, teach me. Teach me. Not so much, let me teach you. Now, why did Paul, or why did rather Luke, he's the author there, why would Luke say that? with regards to, to those from Thessalonica. 
Well, remember, there was a certain group, not all of them, but there was a certain group in Thessalonica that basically had run Paul out of Thessalonica. And guess what? They had come to Berea to do the very same thing. And so Paul says, these Bereans, they're more noble. They're more fair-minded because they're, they're seeking the word of God, searching the word of God and saying, there it is. Stories told, man, I know the man quite well. He was talking, he was telling once the story of years ago in which he was in a study with a man. Man was not a member of the church, was a church going individual, but his faith was in the wrong direction. And this man was studying with the Bible, and he said, now, you got to understand, uh, I was in a study at the time with a bunch of men. He said, you got to understand that this man I was studying with was a big old man. He was a man's man. He was a big guy. And he said, I'm studying with him. And he said, it's getting about midnight. And all of a sudden, he says, this big man of a man, he just starts crying. He says, what's going on? And he said, this big old man of a man, he's breaking down in tears. And he said, it was there all along. You're right. You're showing me the scriptures. You're right. He said, it's there all along. I just did not see it and would not open myself to it. You see, we, we study the word of God. We meditate upon the word of God. Remember Psalm 1, the man of God, where he talks about... His, Walks not in the counsel of God, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law. And in that law does he meditate day and night. So he fills himself with Scripture. He meditates upon the Scripture. And he, he, he takes that and then instills it within his heart. That wonderful passage, Psalm 119, verse 11, we all can quote it. Your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. But it goes a little step further. It's not that we've read the word of God. It's not that we've meditated upon it. It's not that we've even tried to instill it in our heart. We've got to ultimately mix it with faith. Isn't that what the Hebrew writer reminds us in Hebrews chapter 4? When he talks about those that did not mix it with faith, we have to mix it with faith. In other words, we have to say, I don't understand it, but I believe it. I don't like it, but I believe it. I don't see how it works, but I believe it. I don't understand, but I believe it. And so therein lies how we become individuals that allow the word of God to have part in us. And that's what Jesus says these folks did not do. They did not allow the word of God to have a part in them. While Paul would write to the church at Corinth in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 8, he would tell them that this second epistle, in writing the second epistle, he said, the first epistle made you sorry. And I, I'm paraphrasing here. He says, it made you sorry. And he says, I'm not sorry that it made you sorry. And you get into reading that and looking at it, you, you kind of see the reasoning, but it, it's kind of hard to, to at first just follow it kind of in a quick reading. But he basically says, look, I wrote to you to make you sorry. I wrote to you to you repent. And he said, I'm not sorry. I'm not repenting of the fact that I wrote it to you. I wrote it to you to straighten it out. Why? Because at first the word of God that was preached to them did not, become part of their life. It had no part in them. So we have to ask ourselves, are we much like the people of Jesus' day? Does the word of God have part within us? There was a young man one time standing before a judge. He'd been caught stealing a car. And the judge looked at the young man. He says, young man, he said, do you go to church? And the young man said, yes. He said, well, don't they teach against stealing where you go to church? And he said, no, they just preach the Bible. You see the problem? Take the word of God and put it in your heart. These folks in Jesus' day, Jesus said, that's your problem. You're not putting the word of God in your heart. And so consequently, they didn't recognize Jesus. But then secondly, they did not know 
and we use the word know there from the standpoint of do. They did not know the works of God. Look what verse 39 says. They answered and said to him, Abraham's our father. Now look and think about how Jesus turns it on them. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. Now we look at that and kind of, yes, admittedly, we're, we're, we're pulling it out. You need to read the whole chapter in many ways, but think about what he says here. You see, the, the claim was, we looked at verse 37, it has no part in you. So in verse 38, they said, ah, oh, but we're the children of Abraham. And Jesus said, hey, let me tell you something. If you were the children of Abraham, you'd be doing the works that Abraham did. What does that mean? Text-wise, what does it mean? Text-wise, it simply means think about Abraham. Abraham was a man that was told by God to go into a country which he had never been. To a place that he had never been, to go and settle in a place where, where he was not familiar, with people he did not know, that were that were that was not, excuse me, let me get the grammar correctly, that was not his hometown, not his home place. To go there and to settle. To go to a country where, and I will tell you, was the actual commission by God. And guess what Abraham did? He gathered his stuff. And the Hebrew writer, in summarizing it, in Hebrews chapter 11, says, by faith, Abraham. He did. He gathered his stuff. And by faith, Abraham went into a country in which God had promised but he knew nothing about. Now, can you imagine that? Now, I don't know. You know, I haven't taken a survey, but just kind of glancing around, I don't think too many of you have probably moved from your house in the last 20 years. That That's a pretty fair guess, right? Steve, how long do you live where you live? You probably the Since 89, so that's 37, six, seven years. So, that, and you're probably the... How long have you been in your house, Anissa? 13 years? Okay, so Anissa, you're the, you, you got us all beat. I, I got you beat, though. Three years. When we moved, didn't we check out the neighborhood? Didn't we check out the people? I checked y'all out. Thank you. You and Teresa, you and Teresa checked me out. Jim just kept fighting me. <laughs> I still say, Jerry Barber, you know, I, being in town, Jerry and I get to see each other quite a lot. I've seen him a couple of times this week for various things. And and uh, he still asks me, he says, what do you think about people? I said, I think they have great taste. <laughs> and so, but, but think about those time frames, 13, 37, 3, and and. But we check people out. When you check out Abraham, Abraham didn't check out people. God just told him to go. And he went. And that's what Jesus is trying to tell these people. Look, if you had done, if you were really Abraham's child, you were really the seed of Abraham. And yes, from a Jewish standpoint, they were. From a physical standpoint, they were. But he says, if you really were Abraham's children, he said, guess what? You would be doing the works of Abraham. You would, by faith, be acting upon your faith. By faith, you would not just have an acceptance of ideas, an acceptance of facts, an acceptance of the things that are written here. And you wouldn't be trying to kill the Son of God. You wouldn't be trying to say, to point fingers at him and say, look, this is an individual that is a blasphemer. This is an individual that's telling lies. This is an individual that's false. This is an individual we shouldn't listen to. He says, if you were Abraham, see, so you'd be accepting by faith and you'd be acting upon that faith. Well, what is it that the scriptures were right and they told you about me? That's what Jesus is saying to these people. Now imagine, if you will, you're the Pharisee sitting in that audience. And you've heard that. Oh, yeah. You know? He's right. Now let's take it and apply it to us. 
Cursed is he that does not do the things according to the law. Paul wrote, quoting out of the Old Testament in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 10. God has called us to follow him and his will, and that means acting upon what we find in the word of God. When the rich young ruler in Matthew chapter 19 came to Jesus, do you remember what he said? He says, what good thing, what one thing must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, well, you know, don't kill, don't steal, don't bear false witness on your father and mother. And here's what he says. All these things have I kept from my youth up. What like I yet? And he was told to go and sell what he has and give to the poor. And he went away sorrowful because he had great possessions. And we've Heard sermons through the years, many years of, of that, and, and they're all, I'm sure, good, excellent sermons, and they're wonderful, and those that we'll hear in the future on that will be excellent as well. But here's the problem of the young man. The problem of the young man is when he was called to righteousness, was willing to only do what satisfied him and not what satisfied the Lord. To jump off, of, jump off the, the subject for just a second, I want you to think about something. The individuals today that will not listen to the word of God from the standpoint of do what the word of God says, because here's their answer. God wants me to be happy. Need to be asked this question, but what makes God happy? That's what we need to do. Jesus is saying, look, you're not you're not doing what God what makes God happy because you're not doing his will. You're not doing what he has told you to do. When John would remind us in the book of Second John, the sixth chapter, that this is love that you keep or that you walk according to his commandments. This is love, John says. You want real love. You want to do what love is. He says that, that you walk after his commandments. And then he says that the commandments that you have heard from, these are the commandments, rather, that you have heard from the beginning. Well, what were they? Well, in Deuteronomy, the 10th chapter, verse 18, the children of Israel were reminded, fear the Lord God, walk in all his ways to keep his commandments and his statutes, which I have commanded you this day. Fear the Lord. Listen to what he has to say. Respect him enough that you're willing to listen to what he has to say, that you're willing to walk in all of his ways, you're willing to do what he's told you to do, and in doing what he's told you to do, that you keep his commandments and his statutes. For James reminds us to be doers of the word, not hearers only. Now, here's where, admittedly, some of us uh, religious types have difficulty, and it's difficult. And that is the idea of where does faith end and works begin? Well, aren't they in many ways, don't they go hand in hand? In other words, the Bible does teach us to have faith. The Bible does teach us to trust God. The Bible does teach us that we're to trust in him and his will and his doings and, and his, his providence and his care, his mercy. The Bible does teach us that without doubt. Can't not deny that a bit. But the Bible also tells us that in trusting in God, trusting in his will, we're going to walk in his paths. We're going to then act upon that faith. That faith is not just an acceptance of facts, but it is not an, 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 and an acknowledgement of them, but it is also acting upon them to be doers, James 1, 22, of the word. And so it takes both because faith is to be put into action. Go back to Hebrews 11. What did all those individuals do? By faith, they did something, right? By faith, Noah. By faith, Enoch. By faith, Abraham. By, they all did something. And so I'm reminded of the, the story of the, the gentleman that got in a boat once in order to demonstrate this. He pushed out from the shore, and he had a crowd of people around. He'd been preaching for a while, and on one one oar he wrote or had the word faith written, and then the other one he had the word works written. And so he got pushed off a little bit, 
out into the lake, and he began to row with just the oar that said faith. And he kept going around in circles. So he quit. And he said, okay. And so he started just doing the works oar. Once again, he went around in circles just the other way. And then he started using both, and he went across the lake. He says, that's how we get to heaven. That faith is not just, if you will, a conviction, a trust, but it is also an action. These folks had lost that. And they couldn't see Jesus because they could only see the law, but they couldn't put the law into action. Then thirdly, we see that they didn't really love God. You might say, oh, these were Jews. Man, they loved God. They were going through the motions. Look in verse 42. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. If you love God, you believe his will, you believe everything that he said. Now, now think about this. Jesus is talking to folks that were basically custodians of the law and advocates of the law. Jesus tells them, he says, look, if you really love the Father, you're going to love me. If you're going to listen to the Father, you're going to listen to me. But yet they had become a fo- they folk. They had become people that had become prejudiced to the idea of Jesus for the idea of a tradition that they had. And so Jesus is warning them, don't do that. They pretty much had followed John 3, 17. They loved the darkness more than they loved the light. They were unwilling to accept Jesus as the Son of God. John makes it very plain in those verses that we're familiar with. Of John 1, beginning in verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the same was in the beginning with God. And the Word, verse 14, became flesh and dwelt among us. It's the same thought, if you will, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, where he talks about how that that he talks about the mystery of God. And he talks about that Jesus, that he came in the flesh, that Jesus, the Son of God, was manifested among men, seen of angels, preached, beheld glory. These folks didn't see the deity of Jesus. They didn't see who he was. They saw him as a man, but not as the Messiah. They saw him as a man, but they didn't see him as the one the prophets had prophesied about. Why? Well, Jesus says, when you just get down to it, you just really don't love God. And we think, man, that is harsh. These folks loved God. No, they loved their heritage, and they loved being a Jew. They didn't really think about the idea of loving God. And so consequently, they didn't recognize Jesus because they didn't see him as the son of God. They saw him as a man. When we see Jesus, we see God. Jesus came to reveal God. Remember, we talked about this here back about a year ago in John chapter 5, verse 36. You've seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus said, I want you to know, if you have a love for God, you're going to follow him. You really love God. Joshua, we studied here not long ago on Wednesday nights, that great book of Joshua. Joshua leading, leading the children of Israel through the land of promise, the land of Canaan, in order to take over the land. When it gets to the end, the people are always doing what they're supposed to do. Matter of fact, Joshua didn't really do everything he was supposed to because they didn't run out all of the enemy. But when Joshua got down to it, Joshua says, okay, you've got a choice to make. You choose this day you're going to serve. you got a choice. We all have a choice. And our choice, hopefully, is that we love God, and because we love God, we're willing to follow his will. Oh, how I love God. That's what the psalmist said in Psalm 30, 31, excuse me, verse 23. He says, oh, love the Lord, all you his saints, for the Lord preserves the faithful. And what does he do? What does he do with those that have folly? He rewards them. 
He rewards the faithful, preserves the faithful, but he fully rewards those that are foolish. The Lord takes care of us. If we love God, we walk in his ways. If we love God, we're going to do what he says do. We're going to recognize what he says. We recognize the truth. We recognize God, and we recognize a love for God. And so Jesus said that if you love me, John 14, 15, you'll do what? You'll keep my commandments. Not always easy. It's not always pretty. Now, I was thinking the other day for something else just in my own personal studies. Abraham, who these folks said we are descendants of, had a rocky life. And he didn't always do what God told him to do. And yet God used him and God counted him faithful. Why? Because he was trying to do what God would have him to do. These folks, by Jesus' day, they're not trying to do that. And so Jesus says, you don't love God because you would have listened. And so they didn't see Jesus as the Son of God. But then in verse 47, and we're going to use this kind of as the conclusion, they were not of God. He who is of God hears God's words. Therefore, you do not hear because you're not of God. You don't belong to God. Now, I want you to think about that for a minute. Imagine you're a Pharisee sitting out in the crowd, and you're listening to this Jesus talk, and pretty much you've been run over by a steamroller because you realize he's right. He has told me things that are true, and I really haven't listened to what he has to say. I've been part of this group over here that has jeered him, that has talked about him, that has done everything I possibly can against him. And he's telling me that I'm not of God. And yet, like I say, these were the these were the folks that they they were the caretakers and the advocates. Scripture of that day. They were the religious people. They were the people going to church on Sunday. They were the people that were telling folks about what they needed to do with regards to the law. They were the folks that were saying, You need to listen to God. And yet. Jesus said, you missed it because you're playing a role instead of being what you're supposed to be. The application for us then, as Paul would say in Ephesians chapter 6, is that we're to serve God not with eye service as men pleasers, but from the heart. That we serve God from the heart, that we be the individuals that bear the fruit. Remember the story in Matthew 21, right towards the end, the, the last few days, the life of Christ, last week. Jesus stays, if you recall the story of Jesus, Jesus stays in Bethany but comes to Jerusalem. It's just a couple of miles journey. And so he stayed outside. It'd be sort of like, Having business, if you will, I know it's a little further, but but the analogy would be like staying, say, in Bellevue and having business in downtown Nashville and going that distance. But it was only a couple of miles. And so Jesus would make that journey from Bethany back and forth for that week. And he, in Matthew 21, he comes upon a fig tree. He thinks, something to eat. I'm hungry. I need this. And so he gets up to the tree. And the tree is barren. Now, we would look at that and we'd think, well, maybe it wasn't the season for figs. Well, we know that it was. Why would Jesus, though, expect there to be figs on this tree? Because there were leaves on that tree. Fig trees in Israel bear figs before they bear leaves. They bear the figs and then the leaves come on. And if the leaves are a sign that figs are there. 
So when Jesus goes to this tree, seeing leaves at a distance, he fully expects what? There to be fruit on it. And he gets there, and there is none. And so what does he do? The only miracle that I am really aware of that is in studying miracles in the Bible, and I'm not saying I'm an exhaustive encyclopedia, but the only miracle that has a negative ending, Jesus cursing the tree, and when he comes to it the next day, it's dead. Overnight. Kills it. Why? Because it had a profession, but not a performance. It professed to be a pig, fig tree, but its performance showed differently. That was what was wrong with these folks. That's why they didn't see Jesus. That's what Jesus was trying to tell them. You say you're religious, but you're not showing it. So it reminds us to be individuals that look for Jesus, that Jesus needs to be a part of our life, not just, if you will, seen, but recognized. And if we recognize and live with him and for him, guess what the world sees? Jesus in us. This evening, if you're not a New Testament child of God or you need to rededicate your life, our prayer is that you'll come. All together we stand and sing.